Welcome to DLA Piper's At the Intersection of Science and Law podcast. In clinical trials, ensuring diverse representation is critical in achieving greater equity and better healthcare outcomes. In this episode, DLA Piper's Kirsten Axelson and Sarah Schick are joined by Shazia Ahmed, Senior Director and Head of Patient and Physician Services at United Biosource Corporation, to discuss the importance of regulatory incentives to drive racial and ethnic diversity in clinical trials. I'm Shazia Ahmed, Senior Director, Head of Patient and Physician Services at UBC. I've been in the therapeutic development industry for 20 years, and in my current role, I head up a division that is essentially involved in supporting pharmaceutical and biotech sponsors in clinical trial engagement. For all of us involved in clinical trial recruitment, we know how much of a challenge recruiting participants is, even especially for stringent protocols. But ensuring diverse representation is even a bigger challenge. I'm really excited about today's topic. I'm joined by Kirsten Axelson and Sarah Schick, who recently presented their paper titled Incentivizing Racial Diversity in Clinical Trials with Expedited Programs at the recent Food and Drug Law Journal Symposium. Before we get started, Kirsten, Sarah, could you take a moment to please introduce yourselves? Hi, sure. It's good to be with you all this afternoon. I'm Sarah Schick, an associate at DLA Piper, and I focus my practice in the area of FDA regulatory and compliance matters, primarily advising clients in the pharmaceutical and medical device space. I do focus a good bit of my practice on advising on clinical trials, but I also work with clients as a regulatory specialist in corporate corporate transactions and internal investigations, advising both on pre-market products and post-market products in many capacities. So glad to be here and look forward to this discussion. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. How about you, Kirsten? Hi, I'm Kirsten Axelson. Thank you both for inviting me to join this conversation. I'm an advisor to DLA Piper and an independent consultant working with a number of life sciences companies. I'm also a visiting scholar with the American Enterprise Institute. I spent 19 years in industry working for a large biopharma company in a number of different roles, including public policy, business development analytics, and strategy. In addition, I'm the founder of a nonprofit organization called the Preparedness and Treatment Equity Coalition, which funds novel research to use metrics reimbursement to achieve greater equity in healthcare outcomes. Great. Thanks, Kirsten. Kirsten and Sarah, I found the discussion about your paper at the recent symposium really interesting. As you know, there have been incentives for stimulating drug development to focus in specific therapeutic areas like rare diseases by providing priority review incentives, fast-track designation, and even extended data exclusivity. But there are still improvements needed, especially to encourage more diverse participants in research. And especially, the industry continues to struggle to recruit enough trial participants from important demographic groups, racial and ethnic minorities that are really still underrepresented. And as you both probably know, the FDA even issued guidance around enhancing diversity in clinical trials back in November of 2020, but we still have challenges. So I really found your discussion about your paper recently really interesting. And I'd like you to talk about Why is it important to think about regulatory incentives to drive racial and ethnic diversity in clinical trials? So Kirsten and I, when we were thinking about the idea for this paper, we were thinking about it from the perspective of there's this need for an extra push for sponsors, essentially. And we talked about this idea of regulatory incentives to really get sponsors to think a little bit more critically about how they can approach their clinical development programs outside of just, we need X amount of patients to enroll, we need this number to be retained in order to get the data that we need, but thinking about what is the patient population that we're actually looking at, that we're studying this product for. And 
What are the different types of patients that are out there who would need access to this product if it reaches the market? And typically, as you saw in the paper and as we talked about in our discussion during the symposium last month, they're typically a greater percentage of white Americans that are participating in this study. And even in Europe, if it's a more global study, there are typically white patients in those studies as well. And the idea of adding diversity from a global perspective, if you are thinking about opening up trials in Brazil or opening up trials in certain African countries, that doesn't necessarily cross over to the data that's needed for the synonymous, if you will, populations in the U.S. So really thinking critically about how you can get different groups of people in clinical trials and being creative about that. And then providing incentives for not just the creativity, but being able to keep those patients retained in the study throughout whatever that study period is. Great. Kirsten, would you like to add to that as well? Sure. And when Sarah and I were thinking through this paper, We looked at some of the existing guidance that's been out there, and it's good and Mm -hmm. appropriate. And a number of large and small companies and organizations such as yours, Shazia, have been implementing and following the guidance and going beyond and improving the way patients are recruited, whether it's different types of communications, outreach, and even recent technological changes like the ability to conduct remote clinical trials will allow more people to participate. If you don't have a flexible work schedule, which is not equally distributed among all races and ethnicities, you don't have the ability to participate in trials if you have to be at a site at a certain time, for example. So we saw a lot of these things being good and moving us in the right direction. At the same time, we see in the last two years, zero of the cancer drugs that have been approved had a percentage enrolling of Black or Latinx people who are even close to the U.S. population average, much less the average that's actually experiencing the disease, which is too often higher than the population average. So we saw that there was still a real need to create an additional push, as Sarah mentioned. And then you add to that when you think about the fact that there's different profiles for comorbid conditions, things like cardiovascular and metabolic disease. Those are typically excluded criteria in clinical trials. There's different effect sizes for drugs, depending on the person's race and ethnicity. Sometimes it's biology, but we don't know. Some of it is just centuries of racism and the effect that has on health. We don't know why there's different effect sizes in different drugs. So we recognize that the challenges are big, and we need to be thinking about bigger incentives in order to really create this push so that we see clinical trials that reflect the people that actually are going to take the drugs when they're in the market. That's a really great point, Kirsten, and I think it really resonates on the benefits for just diversifying your participation. You'll actually see more results that actually apply to the actual patient population that that disease actually pertains to. We've probably seen that more recently with the COVID-19 vaccine studies where COVID was impacting more African-American patients, and we wanted to ensure there was more participation amongst those groups in the research and the vaccine studies so that we could make sure that the vaccines were effective in those populations. Great. My other question is, in your paper, you discuss the different recommendations on the regulatory incentives. How would that be tied into the current clinical trial landscape? What you're thinking about that? So we look at it from the perspective of either there would be a way to expand expedited programs to apply to clinical trials through notice and comment rulemaking. Mm -hmm. We also talk about the idea, especially when it comes to the extended data exclusivity proposal, talking about including that proposal in the upcoming PDUFA reauthorization. So there are different ways that we think that we can achieve this. And And one thing to note, and I forgot to mention this at the top of this, is for the purpose of the paper, we do talk about racial and ethnic diversity. And the paper was written for the specific symposium discussion. But we know that the idea of diversity is much more expansive than race and ethnicity. But wanted to flag that for our listeners in case that question came up. 
Great. Now, are you thinking specific incentive structures for greater diversity, like maybe perhaps accelerated review or mm-hmm. similar to what has been done for more rare disease treatments? Are you thinking in those lines? Yeah. So we've talked about fast track designation. We also talked about priority review in particular. We think that those would be the most accessible for this particular context. One of the really good pieces about fast track review is if granted by the agency, sponsors typically have the opportunity to meet with FDA more frequently and get more input on their clinical programs. And where sponsors may have a proposal to increase diversity in the trial, or there may be some challenges in meeting their goals of diversity in the trial, that would be a great opportunity for sponsors to plug in to feedback from the agency, knowing that FDA has done a lot of research and work into this particular issue. So giving sponsors the benefit of the agency's institutional knowledge that could potentially help enhance diversity in the trial. And with respect to priority review, it really is more of a reward, so to speak. Did you make a plan for diversity and then did you stick to it? Did you reach the results that you were looking for, the statistically significant results that you were looking for in those diverse populations to the extent that you can make sure that there are meaningful subpopulation data analyses. So with that, you get six months of review instead of 10 months. And I think that could be particularly attractive to sponsors who are really going to hone in to their strategy around making sure that they get certain types of patients into their studies. That's great, because as the landscape currently is, there really is no regulatory incentive if you do include more diverse representation in your trials. It's just encouraged currently, right? Right, right. And FDA has said that they don't really want to mandate or require sponsors to have a certain percentage. So we didn't come out the gate saying you have to do this. So we think that a regulatory incentive is a nice way to balance the fact that everyone thinks this is a good idea. So let's take it that next step further. That's great. And I would think this is a win-win for not just the sponsor, but also the patient, most importantly, because the more diverse the trial is, the more we'll know whether that medicine, medicinal product is more effective for that population. That's great. Kirsten, anything else to add to that? Yes. In addition to the pre-market incentives that Sarah already mentioned, fast track and priority review, We also discussed how a concept like extended data exclusivity could work. So, for example, right now, if the FDA can request or a sponsor can say they want to do a pediatric study, and if they do the pediatric study, whether the drug works in children or not, they can be granted an additional six months of data exclusivity, which basically means a generic competitor can't challenge their patent and enter the market during that six-month period. And this provision was specifically put in to increase the amount of information about children for drugs. And the good thing about a post-market incentive like this is you would get the information about the drug. The downside could be the drug would already be on the market before you got this information. So as we consider these incentives, there's pluses and minuses in all of them, right? The pre-market might make a slightly longer, more complex trial, but then when you get the drug in market, you might get the priority review, so it could cut down on some of that time. The extended data exclusivity would encourage ongoing study in different populations that you would get that information, you know, after the drug is already on the market. And we think all of these incentives should be considered because they have been shown to increase development and interest in certain types of medicines for certain types of diseases. We've seen more drugs for cancer and rare disease. And I don't want to say it's solely that because the reimbursement environment has also affected the development of drugs for specialized conditions as well. But it has been a factor. Yeah. And in my work in clinical trials, and I've been doing it for a long time, identifying or recruiting patients in diverse populations, especially even when you go into underserved areas and just think about different racial and ethnic representation amongst trials that I worked on, This could be really impactful and helpful to sponsors, but it would also encourage sponsors as they work with CROs or even other service providers to actually 
really go in and find diverse representation because some of the challenges, and you would agree with, that I've had across the trials I worked on include the lack of access or being able to take time away from work to participate in a clinical trial. That's been a huge barrier. And some even minority groups lack of information not even knowing that there is a clinical trial that they could participate in or the provider or physician that they do go to doesn't even know about a clinical trial or study that is going on for their disease or indication. So I think this could really be a huge incentive for other providers, but patients to maybe go to providers to ask for more information or want to participate and be able to participate because of even now having more technological advancements and the pandemic with the rise of telemed being used for even as clinical trial options and being able to do e-consent. But I think that could even help to diversify participation. And these incentives would be hugely important. I would agree. And to the point that Sarah made earlier about having the earlier, more frequent conversations with the FDA, for example, with Fast Track. It's one thing to do better communication, better outreach, be in certain types of hospitals and community centers to get to the right people. But also, you may have to relax some exclusion criteria. If you're admitting patients, given that there's higher rates of diabetes and hypertension in blacks relative to whites, different rates of mental health experience in other races, if you're considering relaxing these exclusion criteria, that's a big deal to manage potential risk and adverse events. It can mess up the trial. It can result in having to take people out. So that's not a small thing to manage and could be managed with more input from the agency. Great. Thank you. Sarah, question for you. The work that you have been involved with this paper, and I'm just curious to ask, do you see any other challenges if we were to have regulatory incentives in place Do you think it would be only certain sponsors that would take advantage of that? Or would they need some kind of support from other service providers to be able to provide more access or participation? Yeah, I was actually thinking about that, especially with your role at the CRO at UBC. I think that having third-party providers can be really useful here, although I know a lot of sponsors have their own physician networks or access to various physician networks. But when I'm thinking about how sponsors can be creative, that's where a third party might come in, like a CRO or an SMO or whatever type of organization. And to really sit down and craft strategies on how we can get access to certain patient groups, how we can encourage participation from certain patient groups, and making sure that we get access to the physicians who have access to those patients. And I think that's really the tricky part. We talk about academic medical centers, but What about community health centers? What about individual physician practices that might be in underserved communities? So thinking creatively about that, I think having a CRO coming in to help can be quite beneficial to a number of companies, especially smaller pharma companies that don't have as much experience with developing clinical strategies for bringing product to market. Yeah, I would agree with that. And even if it's not going with the CRO, it's just making sure that early on in development, what I found is always helpful is having a plan in place, Mm -hmm. having a recruitment retention strategy, and really identifying early on how will you find your target patient population, but how will you include diverse participation? Mm -hmm. Really thinking about that patient journey, the disease, the impact barriers, who does the disease actually impact? So we actually have patients that are included in the trial that are actually the ones that probably would benefit from the product, I would think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So any other thoughts, Kirsten? I guess the final point I would make is just thinking about what making a first trial means for the sponsor in terms of the time to enroll and complete the trial. And no one's shedding any tears for big biopharma companies that seem to have a ton of money to invest, but it's also time. You want to get the drugs to the market as quickly as possible. 
when you have different effect sizes, meaning the drug is expected to work more or less efficaciously on certain populations, it's not like you're just trading out one for one, one person for another person, and the trial stays the same size. A diverse trial, if the drug has various levels of efficacy or you want to do subpopulation analysis, is going to be a longer trial. So creating ways to get the drug reviewed faster chips away a little bit of that link that would be added to the trial. So look, I can see there could be critique of these kinds of incentives and that, oh, you're just going to get more drugs on the market. They're going to come faster. They're going to stay on the market longer if you have extended data protection. That's true. But I think, unfortunately, there's a cost to doing these trials, and that cost is built on a legacy of racism and poor health. And getting data to be diverse is going to have a cost. And these types of incentives might be one way to defray that cost and create the incentive that will result in data that's better about the medicines we have on the market. Great. Thank you, Kirsten. Very important point. Well, this has been really a great discussion this afternoon. I really appreciate your time. It's really clear and imperative that it's so important to make clinical trials diverse and really have that diverse representation. That will only lead to better products for patients. We've seen that in the recent pandemic, how COVID-19 impacted different segments of the population. We've seen this in other disease areas, even cardiovascular, diabetes. It's just so important that we work together and collaborate to identify ways that we can improve diversity. And I really found your paper, your discussion really interesting in the recent symposium. And I'm looking forward to following that progress. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Shazia. Thank you for listening to DLA Piper's At the Intersection of Science and Law podcast. All information, content, and materials contained in this podcast are for general informational purposes only. This podcast is intended to be a general overview of the subjects discussed and does not create a lawyer-client relationship. Statements and opinions are those of the individual speakers and participants and do not necessarily reflect the policies or opinions of DLA Piper LLP US. The information contained in this podcast is not and should not be used as a substitute for legal advice. No listener should act or refrain from acting with respect to any particular legal matter on the basis of this podcast without first seeking legal advice from counsel in the relevant jurisdiction. This podcast may qualify as lawyer advertising, requiring notice in some jurisdictions. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. DLA Piper LLP US accepts no responsibility for any actions taken or not taken as a result of this podcast.